Welcome to our 39th Wonder Space Journey. My name is Steve Cole, and since September 2020, I have been asking the same six questions to people from around the world. The questions revolve around life and wonder, places of reset and stories of hopefulness. This week our orbit will take us from Mexico to Canada, and to experience these views with us in this ultimate window seat, we welcome Jonathan Bailey. Jonathan is a global leader in conservation biology and has authored some of the most influential reports on the status and trends of the world's species and ecosystems. Jonathan is the CEO of a media and technology company called On The Edge Conservation and previously was the chief scientist of National Geographic where he initiated a campaign to protect 30% of the planet by 2030, which, as you will hear in his story, has now been adopted by countries around the world. The full-length interview with Jonathan can be found on the Wonder Space podcast, which you will find on our website and on most podcast platforms. For this shortened video orbit, Jonathan answers three of our six questions and starts by giving us a glimpse into his life story so far, with an emphasis on what he's doing currently. I guess I'd start really where I believe my career started, was um, going to work for IUCN. I was doing a master's at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and had the amazing opportunity to, to work at the World Conservation Union in Switzerland. And I arrived there and I found out my job was to edit this book called The Red List. And it's a list of the world's threatened species. It tells you which species on the planet we believe to be threatened with extinction. And my job was to um, really apply a new system of categorizing a threat using quantitative criteria. And um, email was just starting and most people were still writing letters. So um, I wrote and emailed a network of about 9,000 people and uh, together we assessed um, thousands and thousands of species using this new system. And we assessed all the mammals for the first time ever. And for me, that was just a uh, introduction to a completely new, exciting world. Um, and having that base throughout my career um, has been tremendously uh, helpful. And um, you know, I'd never, I'd never give up that opportunity in a million years. And then I went on to do a PhD with Georgina Mace, um, at Imperial College, which was based at the Zoological Society of London and studied island endemic birds and what makes certain species more prone to extinction than others and did my PhD field research on the in the Gulf of Guinea on an island, which is basically well, a series of islands like the Galapagos, but sort of unheard of. Um, some of the, well, the, the highest level of endemism uh, for birds um, per area um, in the world. And then from there, I was keen to get into the forest. So I went to uh, live in the rainforest for two years in Gabon, studying gorillas and starting an ecotourism and research camp um, to help basically fund the whole um, protected area. And I was working with Emmanuel Demerode, who was there at the time. And uh, that was a, uh, a phenomenal experience um, and made me realize the challenges of, of um, you know, conservation projects on the ground that people face day to day. But as I walked through the forest, I had an opportunity to think about, you know, we'd walk for about 20 kilometers a day. I'd think about, you know, what would I do with my life if I, if I wanted to have the, the greatest impact and, and um, help move us more towards a sustainable path? And I came to the conclusion that I wanted to define the status and trends of the world's species and ecosystems because I felt if people knew that, that they would make the right decisions. And really, we just needed to understand and so um, when I left the rainforest, I went back to London and worked with Georgina Mace again. We did a few more, edited a few more red lists, and then um, we, we developed the Indicators and Assessments Unit. And there we helped develop the Living Planet Index, Red List Index, Sampled Red List Index, Wildlife Picture Index. These are all indices of how animals and ecosystems are changing through time. And um, we get massive press each time we put out a, a, a report. But then like three days later, it would just sort of die away. So I realized that we really just needed more action on the ground. So I, I um, fortunately got the job of running all the conservation programs for the Zoological Society of London. And I built that out into, uh, we know we're in 50 different countries around the world doing innovative projects. 
But again, at the end, I realized if, if our relationship with nature doesn't fundamentally change, if we don't value nature more, we could have all the amazing projects in the world, but they're just not going to get to the scale needed. And then there was the opportunity to uh, be chief scientist at National Geographic Society. And there I could do the science, the conservation, and, and really the communication component, which I felt was fundamental. And that was an amazing experience. And I guess, you know, we did tons of things. But the, the project I had the most fun with was launching uh, the 30 by 30 campaign. And that was to convince the world's governments to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. Um, and now, basically, most of the world's governments have bought into it, and it's established. And currently, we're protecting about uh, 15%. We, we sh- the target was 7, 17% for 2020. Um, but the big question is how you get there. Like, that's a big lift in, in, you know, by 2030. And so um, I realized that we're never going to get there unless we can better unlock uh, private sector capital. If we, can, we, we can't do it with just government funding and... Um, philanthropic funding alone, at least in the current state. And um, I also felt that we needed to focus a lot more on how we redefine our relationship with nature. So that led to my phase now where, where I'm doing the two things that if I think, you know, what are the two things I would do to I pop off, basically, if I, if I could? And one is helping, helping us redefine our relationship with nature. And that's um, a project I'm doing or running a company called OTEC. Uh, which is On the Edge Conservation, which is basically a, a, a media and marketing company um, for nature. And currently th- there isn't one. And then um, the second thing is a massive, uh, or focusing on massive scale restoration projects and developing the impact monitoring technology to make that, make that feasible and unlock the, the billions of dollars that are available for nature-based solutions. So that's the journey. And um, so this, this phase now is to drive those two areas forward. One is how do we redefine our relationship with nature, and the other is how do we secure the Earth's species and ecosystems at scale. My story of hopefulness is uh, a story about a woman who's um, really committed her life to helping us better understand the natural world, but but ensure that, that much of it is secured for future generations. Chris Tompkins was CEO of Patagonia. And for the last 25 years, um, her and her husband, who's now um, unfortunately passed away, started really focusing on how to secure large tracts of land. And um, together they, they started um, creating some of the biggest um, protected areas in the world. Of course, it isn't somebody who's come from sort of a traditional um, conservation career that, that has sort of led the way and people have followed. It's um, an individual who started their career in, in the private sector and, and built out, but always had a great reverence and respect for the natural world. And then um, went on to work with uh, local communities and governments and, and helped set up 13 uh, national parks in Chile and Argentina and um, protect almost 15 million acres that alone gets my full respect, but um, really it's her ability to communicate the importance of the natural world and our relationship with other forms of life and the need to get to know our neighbors and understand nature so that we truly respect value and ultimately want to protect it. What I'm always so impressed with is just the courage and the, the constant um, you know, waking up in the morning, taking on these massive challenges and uh, and just continuing. And uh, it's not easy. I mean, these challenges are immense and there's so many interests against securing the natural world. Uh, But when you have an example like this, who's just got up and done it and climbed one mountain and then finished taking a breath and climbed the next, for me, that's a story of hope and respect, but also one which I hope we have many other people emulating in the future. And and it's also, she showed us that it's, it's possible and you see what one person can do. I guess when you say re-enter, there's, you know, re-entering the earthly world, but there's also uh, re-entering in terms of COVID coming to an end, or not an end, but uh, more bearable. And it's interesting because it's, I hope, really helped us think about our relationship with the natural world um, and made us think about our values and what's really important and, and that a world based on just money, making money and having 
money drive all decision making probably leads us to some unfortunate places. And I really want to just ask, you know, having spent time here and, and thought about our relationship with nature through time, it's just like, what are we without nature? Who are we as humans without nature? Are we humans without nature? Nature made us. Nature grew us. It looked after us. It's a part of us. And for so long, we've tried to push nature away. But in truth, we're coming to realize, and I think the COVID uh, situation helped us understand that when we're removed from nature, it leads to stress and anxiety. Um, it's, uh, it's led to all sorts of complications across the earth. And um, I think for the first time, we're beginning to realize that the development of our children, our mental health, is all dependent on a good relationship and time in nature. And then, in fact, it is a part of us, and that without us, we're not whole. And so my question just is, really, who are we? Who are we without nature? To find out more about Jonathan's work, go to ontheedge.org. Jonathan also spoke about the 30 by 30 campaign, which you can join at campaignfornature.org. In his story of hopefulness, Jonathan spoke about the extraordinary work of Chris Tomkins, and you can find out more at tomkinsconservation.org. To listen to the previous 38 Wonderspace interviews, the website is ourwonder.space. I want to thank Jonathan for joining us on this Wonderspace, and I hope you can join us next week for more wonders and stories of hopefulness.